So welcome back to class. And today we're going to be talking about the second part for energy based models. Uh, I hope you actually did review the content from last week because we are building on top from last lesson and therefore there is much more uh, coming out. And, you know, the third homework coming out today is going to be about uh, energy based models. So it's really uh, uh, you had to really pay attention to what we talk about today because those uh, concepts are not that straightforward and therefore it needs some, you know, they need some attention and, and, and care to be able to assimilate them, right? And so again, maybe right now, uh, all of the things I'm talking about are quite not well understood, but with the homework, you're going to have the, uh, you know, the chance to, to call these things up yourself and, and, and develop some understanding of these topics. Okay. Nevertheless, if you have any questions about the, 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 what, we are, what we are covering today, uh, feel free to ask on the chat, type down on the chat. I'm reading these questions um, such that, you know, we are all up to, to speed, up to the point where we can start homework three today. Okay. All right. All right. So free energy. Uh, what was this? This is, this was defined as one of the last slides from last time. So this is the free energy, the zero temperature limit, and it's called, there is this F infinity, which is defined as the minimum value that the energy E takes, uh, with respect to the latent variable Z. Okay. And so if we define, uh, if we have like the Z check to be the, the, the latent, the position of the latent where we have the minimum, then we can simply write that the F infinity, it's just the E at the correspondence of the Z check, right? Cool. So here I show you a diagram going from zero to over two, right? So with F infinity, zero temperature limit, free energy zero in a purple, uh, in green for equal one, and then uh, greater than two in yellow. And then this was the diagram, right? So in uh, yellow, in these areas here, like on the corner, let's say over here, you have larger and uh, free energy, larger zero temperature limit free energy. As you move close down to the uh, region here, with, which is dark purple, equal where this um, scalar field is uh, height is zero. This means the network believes that this is the region where the training uh, where the manifold is supposed to exist, right? And, and we told a few times last time that this is a badly trained network because these purple regions don't match these uh, blue points, right? And so, you know, it's a bad trained model. Okay. Uh, moreover, I show you in a different, the, I show you the same function, but in this case, uh, I actually plot even the height, not just the color, right? So I use this cold, warm scalar um, map, color map, going from zero uh, free energy in uh, blue to 0 0.5 in white and larger than one in red. And so here you can see how it looks, this thing in a basically, you know, 3D representation. And I get to, to spin it around such that you can see how this behavior in the center does this kind of peaked Thing, right? So what happened there, right? Why, why is he picked? Well, so let, let's, let's, let's do a cross section. Let's take Y one equals zero and then let's cut, let's chop this uh, bowl in half. Okay. And so what we see here is going to be the following. We have that at location zero point, uh, minus 0 0.5. Oh, well, minus 0 0.4, basically. The height of this free energy is zero. And this means that this location here is the location where uh, you are on top of the manifold, right? As you move to the left hand side, you're going to be growing up, you no? Know? So you go up this way because you go quadratically up, right? From this location. And as you move also on the, uh, right hand side, we also go up quadratically, right? So we go up quadratically until we reach the center of this ellipse. Then we keep going down uh, again quadratically until we reach this location here, which is the other. So you have an ellipse, right? We were on this region here. So we were down Then we go up and then we keep going down quadratically and then we keep going up quadratically, right? And so that's what we uh, observe here. And then up, 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 up. And so here we have this peak because we are in the center of this uh, 
of these two regions, right? These two locations. This might be wanted, might not be wanted. We're going to be learning today how we can push down that little picky thing such that we have a more smooth energy, okay? So we're going to be learning about smoothness today. All right, so this was my free energy or the zero temperature limit free energy. And why I've been repeating so many times zero temperature limit free energy, because now I'm going to be introducing the non-zero temperature limit free energy, okay? And so enters the free energy, you know, the more generic representation of the free energy. So this free energy before it was in blue, uh, which means it's cold. It's like the, uh, yeah, it's, it's a temp zero temperature limit, right? So it's very cold, 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 you know, zero temperature. The, the temperature is a positive number, right? The, the lowest value temperature can, uh, can get is zero where the atoms don't shake anymore, no? When they are stationary, when they are, you know, uh, still, when they start moving, then the temperature increase, right? The temperature is the uh, average uh, kinematic velocity of the particles in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, what's called material, right? So in this case, I define this purple, which is no longer blue. Uh, this purple F uh, parameterized by beta, and beta is going to be this parameter. I'm going to be uh, like beta is going to be. It's called coldness, how cold uh, this specific free energy is. And particularly here, uh, this beta is going to be the one over KB, which is the Boltzmann cost constant, and then the temperature, right? So this is, comes from physics. Um, if the temperature is super warm, so like, you know, or you're on the sun, uh, so T is plus infinity, then beta becomes zero. And so if you have a beta equal zero, it means it's super, super hot. You relax completely this thing. Instead, if the temperature is super cold and it, it goes down to zero where things don't move anymore, beta is to the is equal to plus infinity. That's why here you can see there is plus infinity, which means that it's super cold. So beta is also called is called uh, coldness or inverse temperature, right? And so with a very, very large beta, it means it's super, super, super cold. Okay. And that's why it's blue, this F. Instead, you know, for a generic beta, it's just, you know, uh, uh, purple, right? And then we're going to be seeing what happens if beta is super, super, super warm in the next slide. Okay. Anyway, so let's look at this equation. Uh, what is it? So my free energy is going to be minus one over beta, which allows me to, you know, later on cancel with this beta. Uh, log of what? One over this, the length of this domain. Uh, there is the S for summation of these exponential terms. Exponential terms of these negative energies, like minus beta times the energy, right? Multiplied by the, you know, uh, the delta Z, the dz. So, uh, what happens, let's say, with uh, beta that goes to plus infinity, right? So if beta goes to plus infinity, the only, only terms that survive in this summation is the term that has the lowest energy, right? So if uh, energy is a negative number, let's say, then you're going to have, like, let's say ener the energy can take many values, right? I take a possible value, let's, I'm saying right now it's a negative value. So I multiply this negative value by a minus becomes a positive value. And then I multiply by infinity. So the only terms that survives is the lowest value, right? Then I take the exponential. So the exponential like magnifies everything, right? Then I sum them all. Uh, I divide by this summation of all possible, uh, the, the domain such that it's, you know, uh, it actually, uh, it, it simplifies as well the, the length with this summation of all the lengths. And so basically I get the average of the only uh, surviving, surviving term. I take the log, the log cancels the exponential and then the minus beta with the minus beta gets removed. And so basically this F beta of Y corresponds to the minimum value of the energy, which is the one that survives. Uh, cool. All right. So moreover, uh, the one on top, we said that is the zero temperature limit free energy. Okay. And that happens to be, uh, whenever we, we pick this, uh, 
temperature which is super cold or beta is super large, okay? So why are we talking about energies, right? What is this stuff? So the kinetic, uh, the average kinetic, uh, the average kinetic energy is going to be this. Yeah, this is the average translational kinetic energy, which is this two thirds uh, Boltzmann distribution times T, right? So this is how you compute the average kin trans uh, translational kinetic energy uh, connected to the temperature. This is in in a joule, right? Uh, so if this is in joule, you have that, you know, the inverse is going to be one over joule. And so what happens here? You have E is an energy, right? Uh, multiplied by inverse of an energy. This becomes a number. This number is multiplied by this domain, but then the domain cancel out with this one. So this is also uh, just a number. And then eventually everything is multiplied by one over this stuff, which is one over joule. So everything becomes joule again and so f again is our energy so this is like again some physics we, we get some connection from physics here anyway uh let's say i like to take a simple discretization right i don't know how to compute this integral uh, maybe it's too complicated too complex i don't know i just want to make things uh, easy so a simple discretization a simple discrete approximation discrete approximation is the following uh, I have my F tilde, no, my approximate approximate free energy. It's going to be the same stuff, right? Basically, one of minus one over beta log of the, the length of this domain. And then instead of having this, you know, uh, S in a you know Latin S, I have a Greek S here. So I still do the sum of these exponentials, which again have inside this negative beta times the energy, right? And then I again. Uh, convert this Latin D into a Greek capital D. Okay. So we go from S Latin S to Latin to, to Greek S and then from Latin D to Greek D, which means simply what we go from a time continuous domain to a discretization of this in one dimension is just fine. Uh, but this one allows me to easily compute, you know, uh, this, this energy for the problem at hand. Right. And so, yeah. So let, let's see what, what is this stuff, right? So I'm going to be defining here and pay, pay attention. I'm defining in this lesson. So outside this lesson might not be true, but for us, it's going to be true that this expression here is the soft mean of my energy. Okay. So it's the soft mean of the energy with respect to the latent Z. So what is the free energy? Zero temperature limit free energy. Tell, talk to me. Tell me. Are you listening? Are you following? Right. Type on the chat. What is the free energy? The zero temperature free energy of my uh, yeah energy. Low. How do we define the zero temperature limit free energy? Yeah, uh, the free energy. The zero temperature free uh, energy, the zero temperature limit free energy is defined as the minimum energy across all Z. Yeah. And instead, if I don't want the zero temperature limit, how do I compute the free energy? It's going to be simply this soft mean. Okay. So you want to think about beta as a coefficient of relaxation. Okay. So if beta is cranked up to the maximum, is super, super cold, then you have this very uh, strict, this very uh, harsh, cold free energy, no? which is exactly you just look at the minimum, right? just one point. Instead, if you crank up the temperature or you reduce this coldness, so you start warming up the system, then this free energy is no longer just the minimum value, but it's going to be the summation of a multitude of values. And this summation is basically, again, as you can see here, is the summation of the exponentials of the minus energy. So again, the lowest energy will be the one predominant, no? because the exponential is going to be you know, scaling, scaling them up. You sum them all in this exponential space. Uh, you multiply by the, the, the you know the delta, but the delta can be extracted, right? So you have all the summation of the deltas. You can take the delta outside the sum and divide by the big z, so those disappear. So you basically have just the summation of all these 
um, exponential of the minus beta energy. And then after you compute the, the sum, you take the log such that you get back to the energy space. Okay. All right. We'll see how these are called in a programming terms later in PyTorch and things, right? And they use wrong names. These are the correct names, the, the names that make sense to me, right? So these names, you have the mean, it's going to be the free zero temperature limit free energy. If not, if it's not that cold, it's a bit warm, then you get a soft version of the mean. Okay. Later on, I tell you why, what they've done and what's going on in terms of programming and, and names. Anyway, what happens now if beta goes to zero? What happens if you go to the sun? What happens if it's super, super warm? Okay. So if beta goes to, to zero, you, if you take this limit and you can work this out yourself, if you want, you're going to end up with this final equation, which is going to be simply one over the uh, length of the domain integral of the E in the Z, right? And what is this? Well, this is simply the average value. Okay. So if you warm super, super a lot, this, the, 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 the beta coefficient, right? So if you, if you have beta goes completely to zero, right? If it's the, the temperature is super hot, eventually the free energy is the average of the E energy across all latent, which means you no longer consider any latent as being more important than the other, right? So before we said that the, for the zero temperature limit, you have a point, right? A Y point here. Then you have to do a minimization in this latent space such that you find the closest point, right? And so you found the Z check, which is the, the latent that best, you know, gives me an approximation of my sample I have. And then I was computing the square uh, distance. That was my energy, right? And so if it's super cold, you only have one Z check corresponding to my Y sample, okay? And this might lead to overfitting because you just have one point on, right? One, one location. Then if you uh, increase the temperature, you no longer consider one Z check. You now have a multitude of Z checks, right? Uh, and their uh, relevance, their contribution to the free energy depends again on this square distance, right? How does it depend? Well, their contribution is proportional to the exponential of the minus beta energy, right? So the smaller the energy, the larger the contribution, right? The closest they are, the more important they are, right? Up to the limit where if you have super cold, just one point takes, you know, you have one to one point. Instead, if you warm up the system, you're gonna have multiple latent corresponding to this point here, possibly fighting overfitting, okay? Okay, this is important. If you crank up the important, the, if you crank up the temperature, you start warming up the whole system, not only these regions of latent will be corresponding to this one, but all of them. And so basically you're gonna be killing out all your latent. So there are no more latents. You just kill your system, okay? So, and you end up in a plain, boring MSC, but yeah, we, then you don't have latent anymore, okay? So don't kill your latent, don't warm too much your system, okay? They cannot survive, it's too hot. Makes sense? Yes? No? We see soon in the next chart how this works. So, I mean, if the temperature is high, beta becomes zero. So each expression is independent of Z. Yes, you, you average out. So the free energy is simply going to be the average of all the energies with respect to every latent. And so there is no more latent. If every latent is treated equally, this equality across latent, you know, becomes nothing because regardless of where you are, each latent will have the same contribution. And so the latent are no longer explaining a different phenomenon. They will all say, oh, everything, like they all contribute to everything the same manner. So there is no more, uh, the system doesn't have any more an ability to pick different options. Every time it's going to be always all of them shouting together, right? The colder the temperature, the less uh, latent can, can be involved. Yeah, the warmer, 
we just take the average, which is not useful because we cannot find the actual good latent. That's exactly the point. Uh, and then this temperature allows you to move between going from one latent for per, per observation to more up to every latent for an observation. And every latent for observation is like no latent anymore. Like you just don't have latents, right? You, like all of them are just trying to contribute to the same thing. So it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, again, that, that equation, that demonstration was not there for you to uh, get scared. It just to show you that uh, whenever I tell you things in a perhaps intuition manner, no, there is mathematical derivation behind, right? So uh, I don't do math here because this is not a class, a math class. Uh, I don't do writing so, uh, code from scratch because it is not introduction to programming class. I just give you uh, things, resources you can uh, use to, to learn this, the, these topics, okay? Anyway. If you remember last time, we had 24 uh, energies, right? One per Y in our capital Y, right? So capital Y was the collection of all these little Ys and those little Ys were some samples across this ellipse, uh, which, which was my uh, data generation process. So we took the 23rd, which was this kind of U shape, nice behaved U shape. Uh, and if you remember, it was like that, right? So you had here my peak, the, the, the green peak on the right hand side. We started with this orange on the left hand side. We run a minimization process in order to find the Z check, which gives me this blue. This blue is the decoded Z check, which is my G applied to Z check, which gives me, you know, this approximation, which is my best guess uh, for what it should be, you know, uh, corresponding value for this one. And then the energy was the square distance, right? But now we change this. Now we're going to be introducing no longer the zero temperature limit, the, the one to one. We're going to have this warmer version, the more latent per given point. So let's fix beta uh, equal one, okay? So with beta equal one, we're going to get the following. Uh, each point here in, in purple, like each point here has the color representing their contribution to the free energy of this location here. Okay. So this is still Y23, but now the free energy is no longer the square distance, right? Now the free energy is the summation the S, no, this S is the summation of all this contribution. Okay. So my question for you right now is going to be where on earth comes the value 0 0.75, which is this value over here. Okay. Ten. okay. There we go. My question is where does this value over here? No, zero point. Where does 0 0.75 actually works very well now today. Where does 0 0.25 comes from? Question for people at home. Are you following? Tell me where, how, so every time we work with computers, we are doing mathematics right now. We are not doing programming. Okay. So when you do mathematics or physics um, or engineering, um, well, let's say physics, I always want to know where my numbers coming are coming from. Right. I want to know where the 0 0.75 comes from before the computer tells me, oh, the maximum value is 0 0.75. Why? Right. You always want to have a predictive model. We haven't talked about predictive model yet, but you always want to be uh, thinking about the answer to the result you get in advance, right? Because if the computer tells you something while you were actually thinking about something else, it's likely the computer is wrong. Well, computer is never right. You, you made a mistake in the computation. Okay? So question for my students, people there at home, type on the chat, where does 075 comes from? Okay. Exponential of minus 0 0.25. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, the exponential of minus 0 0.25 comes from the fact that uh, the closest, the, the smallest energy is this one over here, right? And this is 0 0.25, which is equal to 0 0.5 square. 
And then you took exactly the minus exponential of minus the exponential of minus uh, this is set to one, right? We said, and this is zero point twenty five. Awesome. And so this value is yeah zero seventy eight, right? So this is actually zero seventy eight. Fantastic. Very good, uh, the Joe. All right, moving on. We have the squiggle, right? So same exercise for you right now. Well, how does this stuff look like? So what was the last time? So in this case, we had that my uh, sample here was the green X over here on top. Uh, we started with initialization that was over here. Then we run uh, gradient descent. We got to this location over here, and this was my free uh, zero temperature limit free energy. But now instead we're going to be using the relaxed version, where beta is equal one. It's no longer equal plus infinity. And so now as well, you can see there is a multitude of values. All of these one that basically contribute to the free energy of this location over here. Okay. I hope it makes sense, right? So the colder the system, the less points are going to be interested, right? The larger the, uh, the, 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 the smaller the beta, the larger the temperature, the more they're getting until you get zero, beta equals zero, which is super hot. It means all of them are taken in consideration. So question for you right now is going to be what happens if I take now a point because we said we can take any point in the in the space, right? What happens if I take the point y prime equals zero zero? What happens if you are in the center of the ellipse type? What will you observe? Each will have a similar contribution. Yeah. So the closest point uh, on top and the bottom will have this, you know, similar mirror contribution, right? And the one on the edges are going to be darker because they're further away. Cool. All right. So, so let's look at what happens what, uh, from the previous chart where we had the peak in the center. What happens if you increase the temperature, okay? So that's what comes out. The red one was the one we observed before, where we had a peak in the center. Uh, if you want to be, uh, you know, increasing the temperature, you push down on that small peak, basically, and you relax this peaky thing to be a, basically, uh, if you go um, with very tiny beta, you're going to get basically a parabola. And then again, we recover basically a MSC, like a mean square error, where no latent is going to be contributing anymore. All right, cool. So that was this uh, relaxation. Oh, okay. Finally, I had to tell you how to program this stuff in a PyTorch, right? So what are the actual names that people use? So unfortunately, this is the wrong nomenclature that is being used in this field. And I'm trying to fix it, but you know, I'm just one person fighting. It's okay. So um, I'm showing you here this softmax, the actual softmax. Okay. So the softmax is going to be simply the summation of these exponential terms of which I'm taking the logarithm. Moreover, I put out this term over here, which was inside here was in, inside, right? So remember before there was here, uh, there was delta, delta Z in here, right? There was delta Z and here there was one over the, the length of the big Z, right? Uh, I took this out. So I took the delta here and then I took, uh, I split this logarithm such that you are going to get, I got this term over here, no? That is the, uh, Z over delta Z, right? So I, I put the minus because I, I flipped the thing. All right. So this one is simply, so the, the one without this red annotation is going to be one over beta. And this is called the log sum exp. So my softmax 
is this it's called log sum exponent, which is awful because it's just saying that what are the terms. So this is simply the soft version of a max. Okay. All right. And then if you want to actually get the exact same thing, you need to also uh, sum a term, right? So the log sum exp doesn't have the final uh, offset term. So what was the soft argument? Uh, what was the soft actual soft mean, right? So the soft mean instead was this minus one uh, over beta log of one over n, right? So I just simplified inside the thing. Exp, the summation of the exps of the negative values, right? So if you can see this one, it's going to be exactly taking the, uh, the soft max of the flipped function, and then I take the minus again, right? So if you have a function, okay, like, like this, let's say, and this is my max. How do I find my mean given that I know my max, right? I can take this function here, I just draw. I can flip it, so that's now it goes down and up. I can take this max, but then I have to flip it again back, right? Because it, it was a minimum, right? And so what I written here is exactly this one, right? So in uh, this location over here, I flip this function, right? You flip it. Then I take the max, which is the term over here. And then I flip it back such that I get the location, uh, like it, it gets back to the negative value. Okay. Okay. Finally, what is the actual, <laughs> what is the thing that people call soft max? Okay. So that's simply the soft arg max. Okay. What is the soft arg max, right? So the arg max given a vector of blah elements, the arg max is going to be the operator that gives you, given a vector of uh, n elements, can give you also n elements of all zeros, and there is a one in correspondence to the location of the maximum value. Okay. The soft max, the soft arg max, instead is going to give you like a probability distribution over these values, right? So if you have this is the maximum value, you're going to have a larger value over here, and then you know small values on the other locations proportional to the you know exponential divided by all the other exponentials. The nice part is that if you had two max values, each of them will have 0 0.5 more or less value, right? If there are three po uh, positive, like very three max values, each of them will have a 0 0.3 something contribution. Okay? So this is like a probability distribution. And it's also the derivative of the soft max. Okay. So the soft arg max is the derivative of the, uh, of the of the soft max. Similarly, like the arg max is the derivative of the max, right? Make sense? So these are the actual correct names. And then people outside here, they will call the soft arg max soft max, which is like ugh, <laughs> awful, strong. <laughs> All right. So this is how you can implement these things. Okay. Uh, why do you need to use, why do you need to know this? Why can't you simply implement this from scratch? Because there are stability problems, right? In mathematics, you have to be careful. I told you also last time, uh, whenever you invert the metrics, you want to keep uh, in, in check what is the, uh, what's called, I forgot the, the, the uh, okay, when you invert matrices, you want to check the stability of the metrics, right? Such that things don't blow up. Similarly here, if you want to compute the soft arg max, you cannot simply compute the exponential because you, you're computing the, oh, in this log sum exp, right? If you compute the log of an exp, this stuff doesn't really end up well. Now you can, you should simplify things if, it, if it's possible. Um, okay. So use the actual pre-made versions that are taking care of many uh, potential uh, troubles things. Trouble, troublesome things. Finally, we saw that this um, model was not trained well. So uh, let's see about training. We didn't, that, that was finished. That was the, the part of from last week, right? So right now we just concluded the inference. Inference for latent variable energy-based models, okay? We saw the version with the very cold uh, mean, and we saw, we saw the version with a warmer mean, which is a softer mean. We saw the latent, how, uh, so one latent per sample, several latent per sample, all latent, no, which is bullshit, like it doesn't work. Uh, and we saw 
that in this case, the energy is simply the quadratic distance between my prediction or whatever, the, my expected Y and the actual observation. How do we train the system, right? We didn't talk about training. We did talk about minimization. Whenever we compute the mean, we want to find the uh, Z that is minimizing the energy. But the minimization of the energy is not training. Minimization of the energy is inference. It infers you what is the value that latent has to take in order to give you the best approximation of your uh, value, okay, in this case. Hmm? All right, I hope it's clear. So moving on, we see how we train the system, right? So what does training mean? Find the parameters. So let's see how we find the parameters. Finding a well-behaved energy function, okay, which is parameterized by the parameters of the model. Loss functional. Oh, what is this word? So what is a function? What is a functional? So a functional gives you a value given a function as input. Okay. So a functional is going to be a scoring mechanism, a scoring object for my energy function, because we have an energy energy function. And I want to tell you how good or bad an energy function is. So if, I, if you want, if you have an item, that gives you a scalar given a function. It's called a function null. Okay, just name convention. All right. So we have this curly L, which is functional of the function F, free energy, and the Y, that are my observation. It's going to be simply this average over all my observed Ys, okay, of these per sample loss functionals. And it's a scalar value, right? So again, that, that, that's a big deal. We already seen this stuff in the lesson number two, right? In the practical number two. So the easiest way to have an energy functional is going to be the loss, the energy loss functional, which is simply so given that you have the energy function and you have the observation. My energy functional, uh, my, my loss functional is going to be simply the free energy at that location, right? Oh, big deal, right? Uh, why, why is that, right? So we, we said that we wanted to have that purple location, oh, the, the ellipse coming from my model to be exactly underneath the observations. So for sure, it's a good idea to have these. The, the, the distance, right, the squ quadratic distance of this low location to my points to be minimized, right? To, you want to have a low energy in corresponding to your observation. So a simple version is just having, you know, your energy being your loss, right? So if your energy is your loss, you try to minimize the loss, you basically minimize the energy in correspondence of your observations. Okay, why is why blue? Why is blue? Because it's cold like a thermometer, right? So if you have a thermometer, blue is cold, red is going to be warm. So you want cold or free, like cold, low energies in correspondence to your observation. That's why blue. Okay. I hope it's understandable. Each will. Okay. There was no question. Another option here is the hinge loss functional. So what does the hinge loss functional do? So given your energy function F, given a blue white and given a red Y hat, my loss uh, functional, hinge loss functional, will try to make the distance between my, you know, red guy here and the, the blue guy here larger than a margin M, right? So this is a positive number greater than zero. So the system will try to get this item over here to be larger than M. As long as it's smaller than M, you're gonna have M minus something smaller than M. So you're gonna have a positive number. You take the positive part, you still get a number, right? As soon, and so you're gonna try still to minimize that. As soon as this uh, difference becomes larger than M, so as, as soon as the free energy for this bad guy is larger M times, like it's M is larger in, in, in M value, right? Then this value over here, then 
you're going to have that m minus something that is larger than m, you're going to get a negative value, take the positive part, you're going to get a zero. So the system stops pushing as soon as you get this distance between bad samples and good samples to be larger than this m, right? So good sample, bad sample, the energy tries to, like this, this loss functional, tries to push the energy of the bad guy. So this is bad guy, this is good guy. You try to have the energy for the bad guy higher with respect to this one by m, right? So unless this is higher than this one for the of m units, the system will keep pushing this in this direction, right? Whenever they reach m in a in a in a height difference, then the system stops. There is no more gradient coming. If this is less, it keeps pushing. If it's less, it's negative, it keeps pushing, right? So you push until poof you get zero in this loss. Okay. And this is a contrastive method, right? You have two samples. You have a good boy, the, the blue one, you have the bad boy, the red one, right? So you try to get this energy to be M units away. So it's contrastive method. The other one, okay, what is the problem with the previous method, right? So what's the issue with this guy over here? The point is that if you just try to push down the energy, on the good boy, perhaps a solution to the system, to the final, you know, when you finish training is that the energy is going to be zero for everything. Well, the system, the, the loss succeed, right? It pushed down the energy. In this case, the energy was non-negative because we took the square distance. But if the energy is zero for everything, well, then you can't discriminate between good and bad boys, right? It's going to be all just flat. The system just collapse. The manifold is flat. It's useless. Okay. Makes sense. Right? So if you just push down and then you just push everything on the floor, then there's no more mountains to go hike. So it's boring. There's not, nothing you can do with that. So a, there are very many ways you can avoid that. So you need to have a mechanism for which, which allows you to have high energies for things that you don't, you didn't push down for things that are not good. Right. And there are all different options. We, we, we covered them in class. Uh, there is, there are architectural options, right. Uh, which are systems that doesn't let, uh, you know, there are manners that, that, that don't let the system have low energy for too many values. Right. So let's say you have the K means K means can only have low value for K locations. Everything else is going to be going up quadratically, right? K means you have locations which are zero. They, you, 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 how do you call it? You, you clamp them to zero, right? Those are the centroids. And then everything else goes up quadratically. Uh, so K means by design cannot be flat because again, you choose a specific number of locations, right? Uh, on the other side, other options, are, you know, you have a network which is outputting just zero, then everything is just zero, and then nothing can be done. So then there are other options, like here we saw the contrastive method, and this contrastive method just forcibly push uh, the energy of bad guys, M units higher than the good one, right? Okay, I talk too much. Moving on. So that one stopped pushing whenever you reach M, in this other case, it's a softer version, right? So as you can tell, if this item over here inside this exponential is very, very large. So you get basically the log of the X, but this, this item goes away. And so you're going to get basically that the, the, the loss functional, the log logs functional, you're going to be basically just the difference uh, here. Uh, and so it's going to try to minimize is going to push down on this value. It's going to be pushed up on this value over here. But again, if these are far enough, and so let's say the value inside here is a negative number, uh, minus, let's say a very negative number, then this exponential basically, you know, uh, become have the, the output of this exponential is going to be a small number compared to this one. And so you're going to have, you know, less strength for this pushing doesn't stop. It doesn't never, it never stops pushing, just less pushing, right? You push a lot if it's wrong, but you push less if it's not wrong. The other one just stops pushing whenever you reach the margin. So this is a soft mar margin, right? So the log loss functional can also be called a soft hinge loss functional. 
why can't we simply use f blue minus f red? Uh, because then you're going to be having one going to plus infinity and the other one going to, to zero, right? You cannot, if you keep pushing up on the red one, boom, then goes to plus infinity. No, you cannot do that, right? You want to stop training. Like you want to find a mechanism that say enough pushing. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. I hope so. All right. When do we use soft hinge versus hinge loss? Exactly. Good question. Uh, empirical evidence. There is no, I provide you the tools. I provide you the, the knowledge. I, I, we don't have perhaps a working recipe, right? So, um, you can try both of them, see what works. This is why or how they work inside, right? Uh, so this, there is some understanding of how the mechanism works. And then there is, you know, practical evidence of how these things work in practice. You may want to use one or the other, depending on the performance you get, right? Um, yeah, cool. So for the system I train in class, I just use this over here, not this uh, energy loss functional. So let me start by showing you what happens with a zero temperature limit. Okay. Uh, triplet loss. It's a, there are many triplet loss, right? I just show you a contrastive example. So what happens with a zero temperature limit here? So in this case, on the left hand side, I show you the untrained version. We said that for even lo each location over here, there is one latent, which was obtained by minimizing the energy, which gives me this location, which is, you know, the decoded latent. And so training means I'm going to be pulling this point up this direction, right? So the training gets this point up here. What are these arrows? These arrows are the gradient. And so the energy was the square distance, right? If you take the gradient, this is going to be just the distance, right? So Okay, uh, so if I train that, you're going to get the point and then you pull it up. You take another point, so you have a good sample, you find, you minimize the energy, you get the, the best, closest possible thing, and you pull it up. You get this sample here, you go around the, the, the manifold, you get this point here, boom. This point here, you go around and then boom. This point, you go here, boom, right? So these are just pulling up those things. What happens if you warm up the system, right? So on the left hand side, you can tell here that the free energy for this body over here now, it's actually coming from the contribution of all this value over here, right? And also some of these values over here. And the contribution is proportional to the energy, the, to the exponential of the uh, minus beta times the square distance, right? Yeah. So for one sample over here, you have all of them contribute to this free energy. You can observe these locations are darker, right? You can see, right? The location over here. This point here are having a higher energy and also this one over here, right? All right. Cool. So in this case, again, we said that one point has multiple latent contributing to this free energy. On the right hand side, you can see if I pull every time, you know, what we get, right? So first of all, you can notice clearly that in the center right part, we no longer have this very sharp edge, right? We have a blurred version. And then you also can notice here the purple was all around the, the ellipse, whereas here the purple is uh, stronger here and here, right? So these regions here have higher energy, similar to this one over here. Okay. All right. So what's next? So I'm going to be showing you here if you, if you take a, a cross section of this one over here, right? So let's take a cross section like this you're going to get the following. And so this is the cross section by using different values of uh, beta. Okay. 
All right. Um, we talked so far in you know last lesson and today lesson about uh, unsupervised, no self-supervised, uh, unsupervised case, right? So we had basically no X. We only had Y's. In this case, right now, we instead have a X as well, right? So we were talking about unsupervised so far, no X. We introduce back the X. Remember, we were trying to learn this horn, right? And so in this case, we have the whole, you know, we have to, to see the whole, we have to learn all the exponential thing, right? We, we said that this envelope here, this row one and row two are exponentially increasing, no? With twice the X. And then the, uh, the diameters change from being uh, horizontal to being vertical, right? What we have done so far, it was like taking a cross section for X equals zero. So we took off X. Now I'm introducing a X again. We are switching now to the conditional case. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to spend like a week training this. No. So I changed two lines of code and everything I show you so far applies to this case, right? So this is wonderful. I think there is no difference. There is no major difference uh, in computation, like in a, in a coding wise and neither in a, in reasoning between what we cover so far for one hour and, 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 and a half, basically, or more. And this case here, where we actually have a conditional case. So let's see what's going on. So untrained model manifold, right? So we have a Z there. And we said that Z goes from zero to two pi with two pi excluded with pi over 24 uh, interval, right? And so we have 48 samples in the, in the latent space. Uh, when I show you the, the chart. And so they are, for example, discrete values across this line, which I feed inside a decoder. And then we had the Y, which was varying on uh, ellipses. Then we had an observation, Y with a shaded uh, background, and it's blue because we have that the energy should be low, the free energy should be low on corresponding to those observa observation. And then we had now we have this new item, right? So now we have a predictor. What is a predictor? A predictor is some new component, which is uh, being fed with uh, X. And also X, in this case, is an observation, right? So also X has the shade, and X is going to be my conditional component, right? So before it was unconditional, we had no input. My previous network didn't have a forward function. There was no input to the network. My network only had outputs and an internal latent variable. Now, finally, we have an input, <laughs> okay? It's very important, this is very new, it's very like non-trivial, okay? All right. So now my X, I can make it vary from zero to one with one over 50. So I have 51 uh, samples. I show you my untrained model, right? So this is my neural net. My neural net is basically, as you can tell, uh, telling me what is the size of this ellipse, whereas the Z allows me to go around the ellipse, right? We saw that the Z was that cosine and sine, right? So Z allows me to uh, navigate the ellipse, whereas here, X is going to be in charge of deciding the shape of this thing, right? Of this item. And you can tell here, as I make it spin, how this untrained model manifold look. Okay. Awesome. So energy function. So uh, how do I define the energy function? You already know. So my energy function is going to be this um, red box on the right hand side, connecting my Y tilde, my belief for what the Y should be and the observe Y. So in this case, my energy E of X, Y, and Z, and this is finally the, four, the full formulation, no? E of X, Y, and Z, is going to be, as we just noticed before, the 
square Euclidean distance between my y uh, observation and my predicted uh, y, right? So you have y1 minus this first component, f1 times g1 squared plus y2 minus f2 times g2 squared. So what are the f1 and g1 and f2 and g2? So f and g's are function that maps a scalar r being it x or z to the 2D space, right? R2, the plane. X is mapped through a F to a neural network, which is uh, X with the uh, ReLU linear layer to eight units, another linear layer with eight and ReLU with eight units. Finally, last linear layer with two, right? So my architecture has four layers as input, two hidden, like input, two hidden, one output, right? It goes from X, which is a scalar, one dimensional, to eight hidden with ReLU, eight hidden with ReLU, and then two output values, no, no non-linearity, right? So this is my simple tiny network. Finally, we see a neural network. And Z, the, the G is still the same one. Right? So the Z gets mapped through this uh, thing, right? I actually removed the two W, right? So there is no more W1 and W2 we had before that were the coefficient for defining the, the ellipse. Now we have a neural network deciding what are the radius, rad radii, given that I have a different X, right? So my X learns, has to learn that kind of uh, exponential uh, profile and the fact that it goes from a horizontal ellipse, tiny horizontal ellipse, to a larger vertical ellipse, okay? So I train this model. It takes one epoch. It's very straightforward. I changed two lines of code. I seriously thought I would have had to write a new notebook. I just changed two lines of code. I have this as my input data x as input z as generated and this is how my final train manifold looks you can tell we start from a horizontal tiny ellipse to a big boy vertical red ellipse okay as i showed you before my training data was this one, right? So you can see here, my training data, it's sampled, right? X is sampled from the uniform distribution. Theta, it's sampled from the uni uniform distribution. Epsilon, you know, noise. So here you have discrete samples, right? Then how do I train this? I just use the uh, zero temperature limit free energy, right? So how did I train this stuff? I take one point on this, uh, from my training, from, from my data distribution, I find the closest point on this manifold that I show you before here, right? So I show you this manifold before. So I take one point uh, on my, well, I take one observation. I find, I run a, a minimization process. I run a, a gradient descent to find the latent corresponding to that, the closest point. And then I minimize the distance, right? We said I use the free energy, the free energy as loss functional, right? So I have an observation over here. I find across all possible, you know, values of Z, the one that is giving me the closest Y here. And then I run uh, stochastic gradient descent such that I can minimize that one. Again, I have my, uh, my, my observation here. I run a minimization process such that I find the latent, which is the, giving me the sample, the Y that is the closest. And then I train by pulling this, okay? So there are two minimization process. First one is inference in the latent space such that I find the prediction that best approximate my given observation. Then I run gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent in the parameter space such that I can improve the network performance, which means try to approximate this horn, which was my observed horn. And as you can tell from the final part, I'm gonna be running a very uh, neat tiny sweep across my X and Z. And you get this fully, nicely, smooth 
manifold. Okay. The last few minutes, I show you the conclusion of this lesson, and then we are done. So, what are the big other challenges? What, what's next, right? So, first of all, the the, the big part is going to be that now we knew already. I knew already what's inside, right? What is the the the, the internal ellipse thing? And so, the next point is going to be having a G. G1 and G2, which is, you know, now starting from the dimensionality of this F, right? So F was the function that was, you know, my predictor, right? So F is my predictor, which is mapping my input to this dimension here. But then my decoder now could be a neural network. Perhaps I don't know exactly anymore. It's a sine and cosine with respect to Z. This is a neural net, which is going to be getting this encoded X and the latent, and it has to figure out, we have to train, we have to figure out the architecture that allows me to get, you know, a decent Y, right? So first, you know, option here, basically learn, le learn this, uh, what's called here, learn the fact there should be a cosine and a sine inside, right? So this was the first hard part, we can work as in terms of research, how do you find uh, decoders that are doing the right thing? Finally, which is a super, you know, actual real case scenario, which we don't know how to solve it yet, is going to be the following. What's the difference? Well, the latent is no longer a scalar. This is like, ouch. <laughs> it's a big deal. Uh, the problem here, so the only difference here, you can see, it's one difference, all those things are a little bit sh uh, shifted, but the only difference here is that I go from a latent that it is a one dimensional because I know my Y's vary in a one dimensional domain to this one where I don't know what is the dimension across which Z, like the, the dimension of Z, right? And so this is another big research topic. How do you find the right size of Z? How do you find the right, uh, yeah. How do you find the right latent? So first question, how do you find the right decoder? So the predictor, we just saw it was a neural net. And then how do you actually find the co correct decoder? That was the first challenge. This is big challenge, you know, this is actually a real challenge. How do you find the latent? How do you find constraints over the latent? If the latent is too powerful, Again, it's going to simply just have low value, low value for everything, right? Uh, having a latent that is only one dimensional enforces the system to have zero energy only on a one dimensional subspace of Y. If Z is two dimensional, now there is no more architectural design uh, constraint that allows us to only have low energy in a very specific determined look. Uh, Sub subset of possible values. And so we are going to have like a flat manifold. And this was it. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure there are more questions. I don't know if people are still alive and listening. I hope you're still with me. Uh, the, the third homework is coming out tonight, I believe. Uh, it's going to be on a structured prediction with energy latent, latent variable energy based model, which is the things that Jan covered yesterday. He explained to you exactly how you should be uh, implementing the algorithm. Um, if there are any questions, if you find yourself stuck, communicate with us on Campus Wire. We are always here for helping you. Uh, it's a challenging class. I'm aware of that. You are a very brilliant student. It's been uh, so amazing to see you how, how you know, you, most of you are more advanced than I am in terms of programming. Again, I'm not a programmer, so uh, nevertheless, yeah. So if you need any help, type on the, on the, on the, on the, on the chat, uh, on the campus wire, we are going to be helping out, helping you out. Uh, again, no extension for the previous homework because this homework is going to be even, you know, more challenging and then after this is going to be the final project where you actually are going to be having real case scenario, no? real, real world uh, challenges, right? So it's going to be super exciting and I wish you best of luck. That's it, right? Boy, take care. Of course. Bye-bye. Stop sharing.
No questions, right? No. Okay. Bye-bye.